I'm Caroline Lee. I'm a health economist in our Office of Health Systems. So earlier today, um, Kelly Saldana has discussed the contextual pres pressures affecting resilient health systems and the need to build bridges with other sectors. Natural and man-made disasters are not sector agnostic and affect different aspects of public life. Population growth and rapid urbanization is reducing animal habitats, creating conditions that increase the chance of the spread of diseases like bird flu, SARS, Ebola, and Zika. This is all exacerbated by an increase in frequency and intensity of extreme weather events such as severe cold and hot temperatures, floods and fires. In order to supplement limitations of the health system, there needs to be a multi-sectoral approach to resilience. This means not only building on the work in other sectors, but also ensuring that there is a way to coordinate effectively across all relevant systems in the face of major shocks. So I'm extremely honored to, be, to share the stage with a very distinguished set of diverse panelists covering different aspects of multi-sectoral collaboration for building resilient health systems. To my left, I have Dr. Jonathan Lynx, who is the Vice Provost and Professor at Johns Hopkins University. I have Christine Godschak. She is the Acting Director for the USAID Center for Resilience in the Bureau for Food Security. And OT, please correct me if, I'm, if I mispronounce your name, but uh, we are joined by OT Krivasniemi who is the Deputy Director for International Affairs at the Ministry of Social Affairs and Health in Finland. And then we have Amani Ambale, who is our Digital Financial Services Fellow at USAID's Office of Health Systems. So our conversation is in two parts. First, we'll learn about the contributions from other sectors to resilience and the lessons learned for health systems resilience. And then do a deep dive into how to apply these strategies to ensure multi-sectoral collaboration. So my first question is for Christine, as we delve into sector-specific lessons. You and your team here, uh, have been at the forefront of the resilience agenda at USAID. What can health systems people learn from our food security colleagues about creating sustainable resilience programs? Hi, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have the, the tough after lunch spot. Um, I'd like to just start by sharing our agency's definition of resilience um, and a couple key elements um, to our approach. So USAID defines resilience as the ability of people, households, communities, countries, and systems to mitigate, adapt to, and recover from shocks and stresses in a manner that reduces chronic vulnerability and facilitates inclusive growth. Um, so yes, that's written by bureaucrats. It's long, it's a little wonky. However, it is also very useful and it, it, it very much reinforces a lot of the messages that we've heard today on the role the health system plays in reducing vulnerability, enhancing household and community capacities to mitigate and recover from shocks and stresses, and in reducing poverty. Um, and there's been um, a lot of focus on both some of the idiosyncratic health shocks as well as the big events um, throughout this morning's discussion. And to just also further emphasize the importance of the health system to resilience we do have recent research on sustainable escapes from poverty, and that shows that health shocks on the household are the most common shock contributing to households who had escaped poverty sliding back into poverty. Um, and just in terms of our USAID's approach to building resilience, there's, there's two key components I wanted to, to kind of note at the, the front of this discussion. One, USAID uses evidence to inform the sequencing, layering, and integrating of multi-sector and multi-scale programming to build resilience. So in the multi-scale, looking at the household, the community, and the systems and how they, in and how they interact um, together. The other important element of our approach, which also came up this morning and was wonderful to hear, is the shifting and sharing of responsibility for building resilience and managing risk 
when, re when responding to shocks to governments and, and to the private sector too. I think the private sector has a really important role to play here. And this really is ex essential to accelerating progress on the journey to self-reliance. Um, and I think some of the questions on self-reliance and what does that mean um, were wonderful. I just want to offer at the beginning that one way to think about self-reliance is also what it's not. And it's not self-sufficiency, social capital, social co uh, cohesion, um, and having agency and some control over your decisions, both for a government as well as for a household and community, is an important piece um, to self-reliance and to strengthening um, uh, where countries are moving on that. And I would just also note that, that in practice, um, this approach and this, this multi-sector approach um, that we take at USCID, it really is about bringing cross-sectoral perspectives and capacities together to program design and really intentionally designing with government counterparts at the outset um, as well. And um, I'll, stop, I'll stop there. And <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Christine. So Amani, the next question is for you. You have a lot of experience in disseminating tools to empower individuals and households to accumulate savings and manage their personal resilience to shocks through your work on digital financial inclusion. Can you also discuss that, those experience as well as how financial institutions, especially digital financial services, help build resilience and help communities cope during crises? Yeah, thank you. Um, so. I'd like to answer that question with actually a story. Um, one that took place, I would say, ooh, 12 years ago and one that's taking place right now as to how um, digital financial services helps to uh, communities to uh, bounce back and, and cope with crisis. So in uh, 2007 in Kenya, there was an election and there was, an election, there was election violence. Um, the violence was so prominent that communities did not feel safe to move. Uh, they did not, they could not leave their communities due to the fear that they might be hurt or uh, killed. Um, this is a behavior that we will also see in an Ebola crisis where um, restrictions are placed on movement. In the wake of that situation, the mobile money platform called M-Pesa was used to help families cope with the crisis, not being able to go to work or go to their farms effectively. Those who had the social cohesion and the social networks to tap into um, were able to receive uh, funds, essentially, from friends and family who were perhaps in larger urban areas. Um, this actually spurred the growth of mobile money in Kenya, and it is the preeminent example that we have today of mobile money. Um, but there is another case today in Venezuela where we have a hyperinflationary environment. Uh, we have also a limited um, currency in, in, that is actually moving between hands. And what we are seeing is the uh, rapid growth of a digital economy. That is to say, we have uh, people who are using uh, mobile apps in order to pay for, for food, for gas, for education, for transportation. So these are the ways in which uh, digital financial services support um, households and people and during times of crisis. Um, and I, I'd like to extrapolate just a little bit to say that uh, this is also possible to support health systems. We all know the example of Ebola in, uh, and the payments that were made to community health workers and frontline workers in Sierra Leone during that time. And so this lesson that we learned um, was um, shared and, and promoted amongst in the education space, uh, paying teachers after the crisis passed. Thank you. Thank you, Ivani, for sharing those experiences. Mm -hmm. So in the next set of questions, I want to ask our panelists to lend their experience and off to offer a few thoughts on systems and resilience and what strategies you use to promote and engage multi-sectoral collaboration. So Dr. Links, I'm going to um, turn to you to ask you to share an interesting model that I understand that you have on community resilience. 
Um, what multi-sectoral factors have you included in assessing community resilience as part of the model? And um, I understand that health system is not central to your model, but still spreads over many different domains. So how can you see the role of health systems in predicting community resilience? And under what conditions can this model be applied and adopted in low and middle income country contexts? Um, I'll go ahead and OK, that'd be great. Uh, hi, everyone. So we've just heard a definition of resilience. I'm going to give you a definition of a system, because we've talked about systems so much today. So a system is a network of interconnected, interacting elements. And the key for something to be a system is that the behavior of the system cannot be predicted from knowledge of the behavior of the individual elements alone. The system as a system has emergent properties, and that's key. Up there, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but, but that's a, a model we've developed with CDC funding that we call COPEWELL. And it's a system dynamics computational model. That, ooh, that sounds fancy. But the picture is what I want to emphasize in our conversation this afternoon. Anytime you draw a picture of a system, if it's a true system, that picture has a lot of elements in it if it's holistically describing the system that exists in reality. And for something like the health system, it's so complex that of necessity, it's multi-sector. And that means all stakeholders should see themselves in the picture. For us, this model is around community resilience and disasters. We bring groups of stakeholders together, and we're not scared ahead of time, oh no, what if someone we brought to the table isn't in the picture, because there's nothing that's not in the picture, uh, right? And, um, and in that regard, I just want to make a couple other comments on, on conversation we've already had today. Resilience is a different concept than baseline day-to-day -day functioning, whether you're talking about a community or a health system. And we should be careful to not conflate the two. And honestly, a lot of conversation about resilience conflates the two. Baseline functioning may be achievable in a self-reliant fashion. I am going to call that an independent fashion. But resilience has to rely on other sectors. And in that sense, it's interdependent rather than independent. And so this notion of a journey to self-reliance, I'm cool with that for daily functioning. I don't think that's the goal when we're talking about resilience. Thank you for that. That's, I, love that. I love your framing of that. Um, so the next question goes to OT. Um, you are leading the Joint External Evaluation, Evaluation Alliance and promoting compliance with international health regulations. Can you please provide an overview of how the JEE promotes multi-sectoral collaboration? What have you learned about the challenges and opportunities to improve multi-sectoral collaboration? Thank you. I'm looking at reliance through the lens of uh, pandemic preparedness, but that pandemic preparedness then helps with, with an all hazards approach to uh, respond to threats of all kinds. Uh, actually, I have to make a footnote. The, the JA Alliance just recently changed its name to Alliance for Health Security Cooperation. And that was to um, underline the fact that even though we were established to support the process of uh, external evaluations of, of uh, country capacities for uh, pandemic preparedness. We've now moved on to focus more on the whole process, the, the um, national action plans and their implementation, costing and, and financing, and the, the overall um, uh, across sectors collaborations that was uh, there from the beginning, especially the One Health approach. And 
In addition to underlining the, the need to work across sectors and looking at health security as a whole of uh, government, whole of society approach, I want to underline that there are also need for um, multi-sectoral uh, engagement within the health sector, but I'll come back to that very soon. Um, the external evaluations that were started in 2016 have now reached nearly 100 evaluations done across the globe. Not so much here in this region, apart from um, the US and Canada, but um, for example in Africa, um, nearly all of the continent has, has gone through an evaluation and 51 uh, national action plans have been established. In many countries there's also the, um, the, the innovation of elevating this to the uh, prime minister's office level or the president's level. So establishing a multi-sectoral working group to look at this issue. Then on the, on the uh, within health sector um, uh, crosswork uh, between the silos in the health system. Uh, currently there's an ongoing meeting in uh, Sierra Leone about the links between UHC and health security, how those two support each other. And I see um, UHC more as an individual perspective to having access to health, health uh, services and health security more as a public health function of the government's responsibility for providing protection to all its uh, uh, inhabitants. And that responsibility goes beyond the borders of the country also. So there needs to be regional and global coordination in that as well. So I think this is my starting point and um, happy to continue with practical ex examples. The, those are great starting examples, and I think we'll have opportunity to dive deeper into them a little bit later. Um, next, Amani, I wanted to ask, can you please describe the role technology could play in multi-sectoral collaboration for dealing with expected and unexpected crises? Yes. Um, so technology is an enabler. Um, it enables, uh, it can enable anything uh, designed properly, of course. But in regards to health systems, um, incorporating tech technology solution inevitably incorporates diverse private sector uh, uh, providers. And um, I concur with um, my collaborator's comment that um, we must look at the system, we must begin to define the system more broadly uh, because it is an interdependent system. The private sector actors who support um, the health system, and I'm not necessarily referring to private sector health facilities, but I'm referring to the banking system, I'm referring to the transportation systems, et cetera, that support the health system, um, rely upon it and the system, the health system relies upon them as well. So what we know is that um, resilient health systems are aware and responsive. Resilient health systems use up-to-date maps um, of human, physical, and information assets that highlight areas of strength and vulnerability. And this awareness needs strategic health information systems and surveillance um, networks that can report on both the status of the system and the impending health threats in real time, allowing for predictive modeling. Now, being responsive is not only being responsive to end users, but it is also being responsive to the, to the um, stakeholders within the health system. And here I'm speaking, for example, of, of community health workers who, for example, could be uh, supported um, and in their ability to provide services by mobile decision support um, uh, platforms uh, based on tablets and mobile phones, as well as digital payments, which, which I've already discussed. Um, resilient health systems need to be able to communicate and analyze data. And therein lies um, an opportunity to receive and send information that is used to support decision making and response times. So um, this obviously will um, have us intersecting with uh, internet service providers, mobile network operators, banking institutions, and so on and so forth in order to um, 
to support uh, the efficiency and the resilience of, of the health systems. And I just want to say one, one thing about redundancies. I think that um, technology also plays an important role in helping you to survey the system. Uh, you can even leverage technology to actually just watch the system and see where um, the anomalies are beginning to appear before as an early warning system, if you will. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. So Christine, um, back to you. How can a health system better coordinate with non-health sectors to be better prepared for potential future shocks? How do we identify opportunities for collaboration to increase the use of multi-sectoral approaches? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing I've got great panel <laughs> colleague panelists to help me work the mic. Um, I want to share two country examples, um, and uh, I think one important thing for all of us across sectors, whether it's health, food security, education, um, is that as development actors, that we are looking at, at risk, we're, we're assessing the risks and the vulnerabilities, and we're taking things out of the assumption column in terms of shocks and stresses, and we're putting them into our planning so that we're developing jointly programs that will be responsive to shocks because they are going to happen. Um, and the, the first country example I wanna, I'd like to share is from Ethiopia. Um, in Ethiopia, USAID has intentionally layered um, livelihoods programs, so really looking at um, economic growth opportunities on top of the productive safety net program. Um, that was also brought up in, by some of the other panelists this morning. And then we've also layered with both of those community-based health insurance. Um, so this starts to begin to address some of the idiosyncratic health shocks. This was also all done with an explicit aim of demonstrating the value of layering to the Ethiopian government and, and designed in partnership with them um, and with a plan to bring the community-based health insurance to scale along with their safety net program. Um, so that just is a great example of some of the intentionality in terms of our approach and really bringing together the layering of different sectors. Uh, the next example I wanted to share is, is from the Sahel. Um, and um, Health investments are, are a really important element of the new multi-sectoral resilience um, in the Sahel Enhanced RISE II program that some of you might be familiar with. Um, we learned from the first phase of this program that it really wasn't enough to have um, health as, as a component of other programs, but really um, we needed a much stronger investment um, in health, and we worked with our, our global health colleagues to integrate health investments fully into the approach um, of RISE to and to a full set of a package of interventions. So this includes a specific objective to improve health, family planning, and nutrition outcomes. Um, it really recognizes that health and nutritional security are central to human well-being and reduce the risk of disease or death that can, that can really plunge a household back into poverty. Um, additionally, um, there's a strong focus on voluntary family planning. This reduces fertility rates and slows population growth. It improves health outcomes for women and children, and it reduces some of the pressures on natural resources and government, government services, and it begins to help us build and, and help enhance the ability of households to, to escape poverty. Um, and in terms of, the again, the intentionality of our, our approach, this putting this together involved USAID's global health staff playing an essential role in developing the new programming, but not just the health components. They really worked very closely with technical experts in other in other sectors to ensure that we have our health investments reinforcing our other investments in water, in economic growth, as well as in governance. 
Thank you, Christina. I want to pick up, um, c continue on that theme of collaboration. Um, you've given us good examples of collaboration within the agency and um, at, at the country level. And Uti, you also mentioned earlier some good examples of working in Sierra Leone with, uh, with developing collaborative working groups. So, Oti, I wanted to ask you if you could continue to elaborate on that by drawing from your background working with ministries of health and international organizations. What kind of governance structures would be required to ensure collaboration and coordination between sectors? Thank you. Um, maybe I'll continue with the Sierra Leone example and then take my own country as another example. Um, the, the National Action Plan of, of Sierra Leone, it includes um, some measures that really reinforce the, um, the intersectorality. One is putting in place legislation, so to have a good basis uh, for the collaboration and the implementation of the action plan. The other is to have multi-sectoral, multi-partner emergency preparedness resilience reference group that meets weekly. So really having and building the, the contacts um, that are needed. Uh, you need to have them on your daily work so when the disaster or emergency is upon you, you don't have to think about who do I call. Um, and the other was um, the IHR National Focal Point, so the International Health Regulations. Um, uh, the Focal Point is now a center with six functions instead of being a one single pers person in the Ministry of Health. Also within the Ministry of Health, there's some strengthening of structures, um, creating a directorate for health security and emergencies. Also, they rolled out an electronic surveillance system that catches any signals uh, throughout the country. And training of uh, field, epidemiolo field epidemiology um, is, is an essential component of having those uh, signals coming uh, from the field. So building these structures is really important. In Tanzania, we have um, a really good example of um, a cross-sectoral uh, national action plan that is being implemented in all the ministries that are engaged. And this uh, national action plan was presented to the parliament to get the, the whole society uh, engagement in it. In Finland, uh, our approach was to take a step back from the health sector and create, an e on equal basis, a five-ministry five working group um, that prepared our national um, evaluation and the national action plan and we put it to our um, national committee for, health, uh, for, for security which is looking at security as a whole of society issue and got the authorization and the, and the acceptance from that group and uh, on an annual basis we're bringing back the uh, reports on how we're progressing back to the group as well. Thank you. Thank you, Oti. So, Dr. Lynx, um, I wanted to get your perspective on how can we ensure we get everyone at the table to implement a whole-of-system approach? So, it should be obvious from my comments that I think pretty expansively about the system and pretty inclusively. Um, I just want to want to point back to, to our um, system model for COPEWELL, which is what we call our system dynamics model. Um, we first drew this picture as a way of explaining the computational model. And the first time we showed the picture to stakeholders, they made us pause before we explained anything having to do with computations. They loved the picture and wanted to use the picture as a picture in their work with other stakeholders. Because, it, so I'm a public health guy, and we're, we're always trying to get the other sectors to talk to us, right? And when we start showing pictures that have all the other sectors prominently featured, it helps bring those sectors to the table. And the fact of the matter is, again, my religion around resilience and systems modeling, is all those other sectors are an incredibly integral part 
of what we mean by, in this case, health systems resilience. Christine used the word in, intentionality, and I like to think of intentional convening, right? So you're very intentional in the convening of the stakeholders. And in that intentionality, ask yourself, is there such a thing as being outside the system? This morning, there was some talk about inside the system and outside the system. <clears throat> it won't surprise you to hear, I don't think there is such a thing as outside the system. Everything's in the system. And when you start thinking expansively about the system, the sectors, the stakeholders you want at the table, you end up convening a group that has everyone. Now, mind you, some of those stakeholders come to the table with skepticism. But if you then frame the conversation with a picture that has them in it in a prominent place, you're off and running. And the thing that, that helps is no one sector alone is going to pull off what needs to be pulled off if we're going to get to the level of resilience that we want to get to. Thank you for that. So I have a couple of questions, but I want to make sure that we have time for Q&A. So I wanted to open up, the, uh, open up the, the set of the panel for our questions. Hi, Jill Gay, What Works Association. I'm struck in hearing all of you talk about the lack of gender perspective. So for digital financing, do women have access to this? Um, for the, for the, con the Copewell systems dynamic, uh, women are often not at the table in these convenings. Um, so I, I could go on with my examples, but I'd like to hear from you how you, particularly for responses to um, emergency and humanitarian like Zika, Ebola, preparedness and response, uh, there's a remarkable lack of gender perspective. And so I'd like to hear from the panel how you propose to integrate that. I want to take a couple more questions before we turn it back to the panel. Thank you. Thanks to the panel. Uh, I'm curious about one thing, you, since we have this picture on the wall and using systems dynamics to kind of uh, look at, at resilience, uh, it strikes me that I believe the, the systems lingo and everything, but we live in a world in this room where we really have been coached and educated and straight jacketed into really believing that the world starts with input, moves on to output, goes to outcome, goes to impact. If we have time, it goes to sustainability. Tomorrow we'll get to resilience, and then we all go to heaven. So what is the power of this kind of discussion and model in trying to change our way of thinking, the way of thinking of health systems managers, of development assistance partners, of all of us in this room, to really start thinking about the behaviors of systems as being dynamical. Is this working? Oh, this mic's fine too, thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Wanda Jaskowitz. I'm with USAID's HRH 2030 program and Chemonics. Um, I'm a true believer in multi-sectoral collaboration. Um, I fully agree with all that you're saying. However, I want to ask, what do we do when everyone within that sector has its own mini system that they're most worried about. So they need to convene all the other sectors for their transportation sector. Health wants to bring in finance sector, so we're all convening the same people. If we're all in the same working group, that, I mean, that's great, we're all working together, but I think those meetings would probably go on for seven days with all the issues we're looking at. So how, how do you make that work? on the ground where we see many times we try to convene a very broad group. People don't have time, people don't come, they're busy with their own priorities. How does that, then, then what do you do? Thank you. 
Great. Thank you for the, those thought-provoking questions. So just to summarize, we have a question that I think is applicable to everyone here on the, the lack of gender perspectives in addressing that. The second one um, may be a little bit more appropriate for Dr. Links to address, and that is uh, addressing the, our innate uh, approach to linear thinking and how, what is the power of the dynamic of, of di the power of dynamic systems. And then the last question, um, what do we do when everyone has their own mini systems and how do we actually operati operationalize uh, multi-sectorality? <laughs> Apologies, why don't I let Amani start? especially with the gender Thank you, question. yes, absolutely. So I appreciate the comment on gender and DFS, um, digital financial services, sorry for the acronym. Um, I will say this about women in digital financial services. Um, like in many other sectors, women are the most marginalized when it comes to access to digital financial services. Women do not own the mobile phone or the smartphone that is required to engage. Women do not feel comfortable walking into a bank and opening up a bank account, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to be able to um, address those uh, real social, cultural barriers to gender. Um, however, studies have shown that women are the key to actually improving um, financial and economic resilience in a household. Um, there was a study conducted uh, by two professors, economic, economists, who found that women who had access to mobile money and um, diversified their income, that is to say they did not only farm, they also traded, actually rose out of poverty over seven years. And, the, and you can think of the uh, knock-on effects uh, for their children and education status um, um, for themselves and their children. So we know that women are the most excluded, um, but we also know that the key to sustainability is with women also. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the question of, of, of gender in um, in outbreaks is, is one that is, is truly remarkable. It's the women who bear the burden. It's the women who, who die. It's the women who have to take care of the family. So they're exposed both through their, um, um, in their private life and in most likely in the professional life as health workers um, to the epidemics and have the highest risk. How to get them to the table, um, I guess there's in my country, it's not a problem. There are other countries where it might be a problem, but our solution to this has been education, social security, and gender-specific policies. So this is, I believe, true in every country, so to enable women to be part of the system. Um, and then on about when everybody has their own agenda, I think it's important that we set the agenda. So we have a frame, we have the benchmarks, and we, we make everybody to look at their agendas through those benchmarks about what needs to be done. And, and one of the, the values of the um, pushing to the external evaluation is that you actually bring a measurement to countries that they can look at over time their, um, their success. If you repeat the external evaluations, then they can showcase what they've done and how, what impact that has done, had, had on, the, on the resilience, on the uh, sustainability of the system and, and their um, response. So I think these are my responses. Yeah, I'm just, just building on, on these observations from um, Amani and Uti, I think for, um, for the Center for Resilience and USAID, we have invested a lot in building our, our knowledge base and our understanding of the capacities that strengthen resilience. And that evidence really it reinforces not just the importance of multi-sector investments, um, but the need for us all to be thinking beyond sectors about the things that transcend sectors. And women's empowerment is very much a part of that. There's a, a really strong finding um, from an evaluation in Bangladesh that shows that households where women 
had greater empowerment, fared much better than households where women were not empowered when a shock occurred. Um, in, in addition to women's empowerment, we also need to be thinking about the psychosocial psycho aspects, um, social cohesion, social bonding is really critical to the capacities that um, help both households and communities um, be more resilient and really thinking about aspirations as well and the hopes people have for the future, for their own economic well-being, for their children. These things make a tremendous difference in our impact and they make a tremendous difference in the sectoral impacts as well to sort of maybe link back to the, the last question on um, we all work within our many systems. I think that's, that's very true. As a, as a donor, we work in a very heavily earmarked world, um, but it is <clears throat> quite powerful when we bring people around a, a problem versus, oh, I've got to get my health sector outcome. So when we're able to bring everyone around a problem and thinking about what are the solutions we need to bring to this problem, we then can fill in with, this, with the sector-specific pieces and what we find and the evidence really shows that all the well-being outcomes are far greater when we do take that approach. So our food, whether it's a food security outcome, a health outcome, an education outcome, when we are looking at the things that transcend the sectors and bringing a multi-sector approach to the problem itself, we have greater, longer-lasting development outcomes. I really like what you just said. And, um, and for multiple reasons, but the one I want to highlight is the interaction. In what Christine said, you're not siloing problems, you're, and you're not assigning problems to one owner because the problems we're talking about can't be solved by one flavor of owner. And, um, and the factors creating the problem are multi-sector and the solutions have to be multi-sector. But when I say the solutions have to be multi-sector, I don't mean it's 10 solutions from 10 sectors. It's one solution from 10 sectors. Um, I really appreciate the, the gender question. In our model, it actually shows up in two places. So there's population vulnerability, inequality, and deprivation, and there's social cohesion in our model. If you think about systems broadly, you can think of them as being composed of natural systems, built or engineered systems and social systems. And you need to attend to all of those in thinking through the, the actual system that you're talking about. Okay, the linear question. So um, I'm a physicist by training. That probably explains a lot. Um, and until 15 or so years ago when I wrote my first CDC grant proposal, I had never heard of a logic model. And um, I was responding to an RFP that required a logic model as part of the response. And so uh, I had to find out about logic models. Um, it should probably not surprise you that I'm not a big logic model fan. They're way too linear. And they're they're linear sort of doubly because not only is it input, actions, outputs, outcomes, etc., but it's, almost, it's like whether you use horizontal lines when you draw the logic model or not, we all know it's a bunch of rows, right? And it, it completely goes against this, the way the real world works, right, which is interacting in these very complex, nonlinear ways. The thing I like about systems modeling is that no matter how you do it, it forces you into a nonlinear world. And whether you're using a picture and simply having conversation, sort of 
propped up by the picture, or you're doing computational systems modeling. It, it doesn't matter. Your thinking is going to transform into a more nonlinear, interactive, crossing all of those prior rows type of approach. And that's what I like about it. It's getting you incrementally closer to properly representing the real world, and it's facilitating conversation that's way richer, more sophisticated, more nuanced, which is getting you to uh, a better answer in terms of problem solutions. Great, thank you. I wanted to open up for a second round of questions from the audience. Hi there. Um, you mentioned when you were talking about the systems that the emergent system, so the system that becomes greater than the sum of its parts. And I imagine some of the things that pull that system together into something greater than the sum of its part is the in-between stuff that you're talking about, the interactions between the components. Are there measures to be able to comprehend what those intangible things are? because they're not really the things we usually measure in this field. First of all, you're hired. <laughs> because um, you, you got it exactly right. Um, so if you think about it, the, uh, so systems do have, sh systems do have inputs and outputs, okay? Um, and so, and the, the thing that's nonlinear is the way the system transforms inputs into outputs. And so what you're trying to do is um, characterize the constructs or domains in the system. So for us, all of those boxes up there, we have indicators for it. So we're, we're CDC funded, we do US-based stuff. But, but we run this model for every county in the US and predict community functioning during and after a disaster. So we output the time course of community functioning predicted from a series of pre-event indicators that cover all of those domains. And from that time course, we can then derive measures of resilience. The connections are, are in our model the tubes that connect the different reservoirs of blue liquid. And when you hit go, the liquid, in a, you know, you have a disaster and the liquid is flowing throughout the system in ways that the, the computational model is, is predicting. If you don't have indicators, data, and I'm going to say a little more about this in a minute, but if you don't have data, you still have the picture and you're still better off in your conversation than if you don't have the picture. But the way you really understand this emergent behavior or equivalently latent behavior, so in physics, resilience is a latent feature of a system. And you, you can't measure resilience until you put energy into the system and you measure resilience by the energy you get back out. In our world here today, the energy is the crisis. So you actually don't know the resilience. You can predict it, but you don't know it until there's a crisis. Then you, then you have some response to the crisis you can observe and measure, and that's resilience. We use, we use historical disaster data to try to validate our model, but the prediction of resilience is based entirely on, on indicators at a pre-event stage, some of them being proxies for resilience factors like social cohesion. That actually um, segues to the last question I, I have. Um, so the next session will actually be on measuring resilience. And um, so the question is actually to you, Dr. Links. How do you set boundaries when identifying the systems improvements that we are measuring? So I. Obviously, I think we should all be engaging in systems thinking. 
But systems modeling is not for the faint of heart. It's, it's ugly, okay? You have to figure out all the elements in the system. You then have to figure out how they're interconnected and sort of the interaction rules. You then have to get data to represent all of those elements and the interactions. And then you have to try to validate your system. And no system model is right, okay? They're all wrong. Some of them are useful, but they're all wrong. So, so validation itself is, is complicated because you have to ask the right validation question that's sort of relevant to how you're going to use the systems model. When you think about data, um, you want to, the data, the measures, the indicators, to be a good representation of the system elements. You want them in the real world to be collected often enough, and you want them to be collected at the right geographic scale for, for whatever the scale is of, of the system you're working with. I'm very mindful of the setting I'm talking to you in today, USAID. Um, you know, Dana mentioned strong data systems earlier, and I'm like, wait a minute, I didn't think USAID was used to strong data systems in many of the places it's trying to do the most good, right? And so you, you have to think about alternatives to lots of publicly available data collected on an annual or more frequent basis, et cetera, et cetera. So in, a, in low resource settings, you do have to think about survey instruments, for example. We're taking an alternative approach, which we call the rubric tool. So, you know, I'm a professor, so I have rubrics for how I grade students, right? And I can show them to the students and so on. They can grade themselves, not that I let them. But, but self-assessment is a very powerful activity. And so one of the, we've developed a series of these rubric instruments for communities to self-assess. And our motivation was, it's another way to get data at a different geographic scale. And the rubric is a standardized tool to, to guide them to, to numbers that, that can be perhaps compared across jurisdictions. But what we found in the same way that the picture facilitates conversation, these rubric tools or self-assessments also facilitate conversation. So people start talking about strengths and weaknesses in a particular domain like social cohesion. What does weak social cohesion look like? What does strong social cohesion look like? What do we have in our community? Where are we on the scale? And there's a lot of conversation about not only where that community is, but how they can get to where they want to be. Thank you for that. I think that's an excellent segue. But before I, I, um, I wrap up, I actually wanted to give an opportunity for each of the panelists to um, just provide to help, to help me in this wrap up. We've already heard a lot um, about your sector specific contributions and also strategies for engaging multi-sectorally. But I want to use this opportunity to have a much more forward looking um, closing statement from each of you and I wanted to start with, with Imani. I think that uh, uh, I really appreciate um, all that you have said, Professor, and I th it, 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 for me it resonates. Um, I live in a, in a financial system, um, and I try to lean that in towards um, marginalized communities, and so um, I've, I think that the way forward for us is to maintain that systems thinking, to invite um, differences of not necessarily opinion, but differences of technical capacities and technical backgrounds in order to find solutions that are common solutions but come from multidisciplinary backgrounds. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I came here from a meeting at Johns Hopkins discussing uh, common goods for health, which are uh, functions that it makes sense for the government to uh, provide them, which have a great impact on hum human life and economy. And the conclusion from that meeting is that um, health systems are expensive, common goods are, are easy to do and, and inexpensive, so we should invest in, in, in making them true.
Um, maybe just in, in wrapping up, um, I'd just like to highlight maybe a couple challenges and things for all of us to be thinking about and engaging on. Um, I think there is still a tremendous amount to learn in this space and a lot to learn in terms of models of integration. Um, we're actually, I, I noted the Ethiopia model um, earlier, we're actually investing in some operational research on that model to help us further our understanding of what really does work in terms of integrating um, across, across sectors. Um, one area that we haven't talked so much about um, in this discussion that's really key to the well-being outcomes we're all seeking is, um, is thinking, through, thinking about the, the drivers of, of malnutrition. They're very complex. They're interrelated across the system, if it's one system, but across, and across sectors. Um, and if we're really going to think about sustainably improving our nutrition outcomes, um, we really do need to be thinking about the household, community level, as well as how we strengthen the underlying food, health, and water structures that communities rely on. Um, and I think one of the challenges we have going forward um, is really thinking about how we more directly link our, our market systems um, and economic uh, activities and interventions with our nutrition goals. And I think that's a rich space that we all need to um, really be thinking about and doing a, a lot of learning, and that's going to have an an impact on the well-being outcomes we're seeking um, in the agricultural sector, on around food security, as well as in the health sector. So from a systems perspective, all problems are shared problems. And the moment we accept that, we accept that the most efficient and effective path toward solving those problems is a multi-sector approach because it's literally in every sector's best interest to participate together. So it's not about sort of kumbaya moments here. It's actually about being selfish. And the nice thing is it's in everybody's selfish best interest to work together in a multi-sector way taking a systems approach. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Gus. I, I, we've heard a lot about, um, first we started out with a framing from, of the agency's thinking on, um, on resilience from, as, as originated from BFS, and we did a deep dive into complexity thinking, and, and a lot of it prob flew over my head, so <laughs> I'm going to probably go home today and, and, and Google your research, so I have actually a little bit more depth to, to this conversation. And then we got some excellent examples from Amani on digital, fi on digital financial inclusion, from OT, from her experiences um, in the governance uh, space for en enhancing coordination and collaboration. Um, so please join me in giving a round of applause to you. Thank you.